it's a real pleasure to have a chance to share with you an update on where we are in tackling the climate crisis. And in contrast to most of what you've heard recently about climate, I'm not going to focus primarily on impacts. I'm going to focus primarily on understanding how we can accelerate progress and delivering real solutions that make a difference for ecosystems, for people, and for economies. And the fundamental starting point is that we all live in a, in a world that is out of time. The most recent report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was released in autumn of last year. And the conclusion of that report was that it's unequivocal that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, ocean, and land. Widespread and rapid changes in the atmosphere, ocean, cryosphere, and biosphere have occurred. What's important about this statement isn't that it highlights the magnitude of the impacts, it's that all sense of probability has been dropped and all of the likelihood statements that have characterized the way we've described climate change in the past have disappeared. And we know that climate change has occurred. We know that it will continue to occur. And we know that we're already experiencing the impacts of it. Before I start focusing on solutions, I, I, I would like to address one issue. Maybe this is in the spirit of being slightly defensive, but it's about whether the scientific community has informed us properly or potentially misled us about where we were headed. And <clears throat> the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has been the world's frontline entity for delivering assessments about where we're headed with climate. And its very first report was in 1990, 20, 32 years ago. And um, if you look at the left-hand panel on the screen, you can see the um, squiggly colored lines are the trajectory of what the actual global temperature has been based on the monitoring networks that are run by a bunch of independent entities and all get exactly the same thing pretty much. Uh, the solid black line prior to 1990 is what had been the observed response of the from the models until that point, and then the solid black line to the right of the 1990 dash line is the projected future <clears throat> warming as of 1990, where they thought we were headed in 1990. And what you can see is that those projections ended up pretty much in the center of the actual spread of observations, so that as of 1990, 30 two years ago, the scientific community was pretty much bang on in their projections of where we were headed if we continued our emissions of heat trapping gases. 11 years later, by the time the IPCC issued their third assessment report, you can see the, the pattern on the right-hand side of the screen, the, the same exact thing, uh, squiggly lines are the observations, black line is the model, hindcast uh, prior to 2000 and forecast to the light of 2000. And again, the forecast was pretty much as squarely in the middle of what turned out to be the observations as possible. So our challenge with dealing with climate change isn't that we didn't have appropriate warnings that the climate was changing. It's been something else. And it's the something else that I want to focus on today. And I want to do that by addressing um, four key topics. What's the target? What, what should the target be, the, the temperature to which we want to limit warming? Why is it that we're out of time? Why is this time dependent? And then finally, what are the things we can do to accelerate progress? And I'll provide a jump to the conclusions of the talk that we really need to mitigate to take actions to limit warming somewhere in the range of one and a half to two degrees Celsius. But we need to adapt for a higher target. And I'm proposing that we target adaptation to a warming of two and a half. Not that that's where I think we'll get, but that that's the precautionary approach. So how do we think about what the target is? We can go back to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which was approved in 1992. And Article 2 states that the 
goal of the convention is to prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. I would argue that we have failed uh, to meet that goal. We have already initiated and are in experiencing dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. And we need to cope with the fact that we're, we're no longer operating in the strict terms of meeting the goal of the, of the UN framework convention on climate change. A really interesting feature of this article two text is the, is the closing phrase about, and to enable economic development to proceed in a sustainable manner. I would argue that the framers of the convention were thinking of this mainly in the context of preventing climate change from eroding opportunities so much that sustainable development was no longer a possibility. But an additional element that's important to consider in the context of the material we want to go through today and, and our prospects moving forward is that we need to make sure that the responses to climate change don't impact opportunities for sustainable development, particularly in the world's poorest countries. So that, that tells us something about uh, what the, that we missed the ideal target that was conceptualized in the 1992 Framework Convention on Climate Change. The Paris Agreement approved in 2015 is a little bit more explicit and it argues that the agreement aims to hold the increase in global average temperature to well below two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial and, and really interestingly, and to pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 C above pre-industrial. Uh, there has been a, a long debate in the scientific circles about the difference between a 2C and a, and a 1.5C target in terms of their impacts. And there's no question that a lower limit to the amount of warming that occurs decreases the amount of impacts. But it's really hard to know how we should think about the trade-off between the additional impacts that come from additional warming and the additional expense and disruption that comes from the amount of expenditures that are required in order to limit the warming. And, and I want to provide the way I think about finding the target that makes the most sense. And, and the starting point is that we should be as ambitious as possible. There, there's no question that climate change is the defining challenge of our era. And there's no question that it's caused by humans and humans are responsible for delivering solutions. And there's no question that we have the technologies to go a long way toward delivering solutions now. Uh, second and really important is that we wanna make sure that whatever we do, we avoid truly catastrophic tipping points. Uh, some of these are tipping points where, uh, for example, we might be committed to to uh, 10 or more meters of sea level rise and approximately 50 feet of sea level rise over a period of centuries. And that would fundamentally reshape the Earth's coastline and eliminate several low-lying countries. And we also wanna make sure that we avoid a tipping point where we have a, a massive loss of biodiversity or where ecosystems start releasing very large amounts of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. There are a series of these tipping points and we have high confidence that they're out there somewhere. In general, we have less confidence about the exact temperatures that might trigger them. But in general, none of the truly catastrophic tipping points look like they have a high probability occurring at a warming less than 2C, which points somewhat toward a, a, a 2C rather than a 1.5C target. It's also really important that we think about stabilizing climate in a way that preserves options for adaptation. We can, with all the tools we have for science evaluation and assessment, make some pretty good guesses about what a warmer future will look like. But we also have a pretty clear picture that if it warms beyond uh, the limits of 
something like 3C, we're in a world that is so different from the present that all bets on adaptation are off and that we really can't imagine how we can synthesize a livable world if we're in a, a, a world in the later decades of this century that's a world of continued high emissions where we're looking at warming of three or four or even more. And it's also especially important that we um, that we're aware of the fact that we can't just flip a switch and immediately stop releasing greenhouse gases to the environment. As much as we'd like to do that, we're constrained by how long it takes to build new technology, how long it takes to get that technology incorporated into our infrastructure. And, and those constraints are especially challenging in developing countries where you know, they're struggling to set up fundamental infrastructure for public health care, for transportation, for communications, and where responding to the climate challenge is an additional layer that in many cases is not practical and that really sets limits on how fast the global response can occur. So putting all these things together, it's clear that um, we, we can't allow climate change to occur at the level of pushing us outside the range of possible adaptation. We can't allow climate change to occur to the level that we experience end of, end of century temperatures that are three or four C warmer than pre-industrial. But we need to think about preparing for temperatures that may be higher than the right target. And that's why I wanna advocate for adapting to warming as much as 2.5 Celsius, substantially above where we do encounter fundamental risks of tipping points, fundamental threats to preserving options for adaptation. Why is it that I keep emphasizing the fact that we're out of time? The reason is, is really clear. There is a strong and almost linear relationship between the total amount of carbon dioxide that's released to the atmosphere as a result of human activities and the total amount of warming that occurs. The cumulative total CO2 emissions since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, every ton makes a difference for how much warming occurs. Uh, we currently are looking at having emitted something like 2,400 billion tons of CO2 to the atmosphere. And you can follow the emissions and the historical temperature in the squiggly black line on, on this figure. And you can trace the trajectory of possible futures in the, uh, in the funnel shaped blue, orange, and, and uh, pink segments of the figure. Uh, essentially, what this is telling us is that if we want to limit warming to one and a half Celsius, we have a total budget of something like 2,800 billion tons of CO2, and um, that uh, emitting more than that commits us to more warming. One of the drivers of this relationship is the fact that warming from CO2 is essentially permanent, at least on the scale of thousands of years. So when we talk about solving climate change, we're not in general talking about cutting emissions and having the temperature go back down to pre-industrial. We're talking about cutting emissions to zero as a prerequisite for preventing further warming. There are some additional steps we might take to remove greenhouse gases from the atmosphere, but an important starting frame is that climate change is essentially permanent in the context of the natural processes. It's another way to think about the uh, time component. We know that um, we have a, a forever budget of CO2 emissions of around 2,800 billion tons of CO2 for a two-thirds probability of limiting warming to, to 1.5. The budget is somewhat higher for limiting warming to 2, to 2C. Through 2019, we had uh, emitted just less than 2,000 
400 billion tons of CO2. And that leaves a remaining forever budget of around 400 billion tons. Now in 2019, the emissions rate was around 40 billion tons per year. In 2020, it was just slightly less than that. And if you just say, well, if we continued business as usual and operated at the 2020 emissions rate, when we use up the remaining forever budget, the answer is pretty intimidating. At the current pace, uh, we would use up the entire budget that we will have forever for a 66% probability of staying below 1.5 C in less than 10 years. We are absolutely against a, a time wall. And, and that's the, uh, the fundamental reason that, that we need to find a way to accelerate progress. I, I wanna use one more graphical tool to, to illustrate the magnitude of the change that's required to get us to zero emissions. If you look at the history of emissions of greenhouse gases, you can see that um, emissions really began to accelerate in the middle of the 19th century, and they've grown really rapidly, especially over the last uh, two thirds of a century or so. If we take this concept of the remaining budget and, and uh, think about a context where, where we uh, rapidly decarbonize, you can draw a decarbonization triangle. And if you distribute the remaining budget for a two thirds probability of limiting warming to 2C, that means we need to hit zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2086. That's a time frame that's probably reasonable. If we do the same calculation for remaining below 1.5 C, that means we need to hit zero emissions globally by 2045. That's an, a level that the IPCC argued in 2018 was technically possible if we began decarbonizing immediately, even the few years since the release of that 2018 IPCC report have made it increasingly unlikely, I would say very unlikely, that it's technically feasible to make that target. So let me transition now to where we are in 2020 and what the solution space looks like. So uh, the end of, of 2021, we um, seeing continued warming. I just saw the numbers for 21 today. 2021 was the sixth warmest year in the record. 2020 was the second warmest year. Temperatures are up. Uh, in 2020, the CO2 emissions were, were down as a result of the pandemic, not because we figured out how to disconnect economic activity and CO2 emissions, but because CO2 emissions and economic activity are still quite connected and uh, illustrated in the approximately 7% decline in emissions in 2020. And of course, the impacts continue to be stark, uh, whether you're in California, Europe, in Australia, or anywhere around the world. But I want to argue that important component of this is that opportunities are way up, whether they're opportunities for innovative energy storage. Uh, this is Stanford Central Energy Facility. Whether there are opportunities for uh, doing a better job of managing our landscapes with, for example, prescribed burns, or whether they're through the political process as we see with the Paris Agreement. A, a fundamental starting point for how we can make progress in the future is that we now have a landscape that I would argue has fundamentally changed. In previous years, we conceptualized the solution problem to the climate challenges as thinking about that we have a fixed pool of resources. We need, need to think about allocating them between mitigation, adaptation, and sustainable development. But increasingly, what we see is that 
there are opportunities to make investments that advance all three of these objectives at the same time. And by focusing on those investments, we get a big increase in efficiency. Where are we in terms of actually delivering the technologies? There are a wide range of attractive options. It's pretty clear that we're not going to see one option be the dominant one, but whether we're talking about uh, wind or solar for electricity generation or um, biomass for, for energy or, or even hydropower, there are lots and lots of options that uh, are compelling, uh, available at, at compelling prices. It's now the case that wind and solar are cheaper than coal in almost all the world. It's clearly the case that renewables are, are growing rapidly, but it's also the case that the, we still have some fundamental technology limits. And I'd argue that the biggest technology limit we face on delivering um, carbon-free energy is, is long-term storage, storage at the scale of, of, of many months. And we have some opportunities for doing that in large reservoirs. Uh, but when we talk about delivering comprehensive electrification, we need to recognize that that's practical currently only in places that have a large non-renewable energy grid that can be activated in order to provide energy during the times when uh, renewables aren't meeting the need. And so we definitely have a, a, a huge amount of research that needs to be invested in solving this storage challenge if we can reach the level of complete decarbonization that's essential for uh, bringing greenhouse gases down, emissions down to zero. When you think about the pace of, of growth of renewables, it's really staggering how much increase we're seeing in the, in the rate at which renewables are incorporated in the grid. Uh, but it's also important to recognize that there's still a, a pretty small part and that a lot of the challenge we need to think about moving forward is, is, is how to um, develop an uh, energy system that can, that can tolerate and thrive on higher and higher commitments of, of renewable energy. If you were a reader of Oil and Gas Investor Magazine in 2019, you, you would look at the pattern of surging growth in renewables and say, wow, I, it's hard to see that they're making a dent uh, because from the perspective of the global energy system, wind and solar are the yellow line that's just gradually climbing across the, the bottom of this picture. I also wanna emphasize that when we think about delivering solutions, in, in some ways, bringing renewables on the grid is the easy part of the problem. We know there are about 20% of the current utilization of fossil fuels is for components of the economy that are really difficult to decarbonize. It's things like air transportation, heavy vehicles, uh, manufacturing of, of steel and cement, areas where we not only need a commitment, but we need real technology advances if we're going to be able to bring the greenhouse gases associated with these processes down to zero. And then for other greenhouse gases, especially those that are associated with agriculture, there are real challenges in uh, not having the fundamental technology solutions that are required to reduce uh, for example, uh, methane emissions from cattle down to zero. And we need to recognize that there's a critical set of problems that need to be solved before we can achieve the reality of zero carbon emissions. So uh, can we achieve 1.5 with decarbonization only? IPCC concluded that it's possible, but very, very hard requires global emissions to fall to zero around 2050. And even in the rich world, we've made relatively little progress. Now, one of the things that I find most frustrating in this space is that no countries have proposed to decarbonize well before 2050. And we tend to be working in an environment in which 
uh, even the ambitious players have said, I'm very ambitious and I aspire to uh, be as good as the average. And, and uh, until, we, until we find a way for key actors to aspire to more than the average, we're gonna face really big challenges. And when I look at the budget, it looks to me that uh, the Paris commitment, the Paris agreement goal of well under 2C is feasible, but it's really difficult with decarbonization only. Often I speak, spend the whole talk talking about the implications of different policy levers and which policy levers are likely to be more effective. I think when we look broadly at the problem, we need to recognize that we have access to a wide range of policy tools from traditional command and control approaches to carbon tax and dividend to uh, cap and trade systems and that we don't really know which of those are likely to work and which are likely to be more efficient. I, I believe the economists that a carbon tax would be an efficient way to do it. But you look at the politics and we really can't say what's going to work. And for that reason, I'm an advocate of taking a, a broad portfolio of policy options on board, exploring how they work in different settings and recognizing that the policy world is one where we should expect some advances and we should expect some setbacks and taking a, a, a broad comprehensive approach is likely to serve us better than putting all our eggs on a small number of policy baskets. I also want to talk for just a minute about where we are in terms of thinking about environmental justice. And this gets back to the wording of the UN Framework Convention that we should achieve climate stabilization within a time frame sufficient to enable economic development to proceed in a sustainable manner. And the implication of that is that we need to recognize that there are some actors that are likely to continue to need fossil fuels for, I have one to two generations here, but 20 to 40 to maybe even 60 years for countries that don't have a fundamental infrastructure in place for transportation or manufacturing or delivering energy, it's likely that we will need to continue to take advantage of, of fossil fuels in order to deliver the energy for economic growth in, in much of the poor world over the next one to two generations. Mm -hmm. and, and when I think about the, the uh, implications of that for the overall solutions, the main thing it points to me is that there need to be some actors who are even more ambitious, much more ambitious than the mean. And I'll just note that Stanford, the richest university in the richest state in the richest country is committed to zero net emissions by average. How can it be that, that we only aspire to do as good as the whole world needs to do in this problem? It's really, really clear that we have uh, to make fundamental progress in raising ambition across the spectrum and recognizing that there are opportunities as well as burdens associated with leadership. Now, before I close, I want to just ask whether there are other options for addressing the climate challenge. Um, I'll speak some more about adaptation, coping with the warming that can't be avoided. There are some possibilities for carbon removal. Can we, can we continue to emit greenhouse gases, but also remove them? Or there are options potentially for kind of way out there solutions like solar geoengineering, where instead of removing the greenhouse gases, we cover over their impacts with a, with a, uh, a different pollutant, essentially hiding some of their effects. Mm -hmm. I'll speak just a little about these two sets of options, but I think they're of limited relevance to the core issues we want to address. Carbon dioxide removal, we can think about two families of strategies. One's called natural climate solutions, essentially increasing the amount of carbon in the biosphere. And then there are industrial solutions that essentially require uh, grabbing carbon out of the atmosphere and pumping it into underground geological reservoirs. 
both of these have potential. They may scale to represent a substantial fraction of the solution space. And I think optimistically, we may be able to use carbon dioxide removal at a scale that's comparable to, for example, the difficult to decarbonize sectors on the, on the order of something like 20% uh, of current emissions. But it's pretty clear that they're not a comprehensive solution at the scale of 50% of or more of the overall solution at this point. Solar geoengineering, super poorly understood. I had the privilege of chairing a committee of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine last year on this topic to try and figure out if we even know enough to do more research. And the answer is that there's some evidence that we might be able to cool the climate by injecting pollutants into the atmosphere. And we might even be able to get to the stage where we could have a good conversation about whether or not we should do that. But it's really hard to figure out how to govern it, how to make sure that all voices are effectively heard. And uh, it's really hard to get from where we are now to have a sufficient amount of information to really be able to, um, to, to think about deploying this. And at this point, my guess is that we won't see solar geoengineering be a, a part of a, of a thoughtful portfolio of solutions in the next few decades. I want to close with some thoughts on adapting to 2.5. And in general, we think of climate adaptation as coping as effectively as possible with the climate changes that can't be avoided. But I want to shift the frame and emphasize that by investing in adaptation, we're not only protecting communities from the impacts of climate change, but we're also increasing the enabling of economic activity and sustainable development. What we want to be thinking about is investing in adaptations that not only protect us from future risks, but that enhance current opportunities. So we want to think about strategies that reduce risk now while also providing opportunities for increasing the rate of sustainable development. And there are lots of things that we can imagine doing in the adaptation space and lots where we have good examples. Insurance is a premium example of, of effective climate adaptation. Uh, we know that early warning systems are very effective and typically at very low cost. Uh, we know that protective structures, this is the, uh, the Thames River barrier in London can make a huge difference at a, at a low cost. Uh, it's, it, it's strange to talk about it, but sometimes activity switching uh, can, can open economic opportunities. And as frustrating as it is, uh, many uh, resort areas have discovered that there's, there's more uh, money in summertime sports than in wintertime sports. And then a final set of adaptation options that we increasingly need to be looking at are, are relocation out of areas that are simply so dangerous that they can't be protected. So let me close with thoughts on where we are for accelerating progress. Leaving the Glasgow Convention of the Parties last fall, I was struck that there's too little leadership the very most ambitious actors were striving to be as good as the average. We need what, much better than that. Um, there's too little appreciation of common but differentiated responsibilities, which in the lingo of the Framework Convention on Climate Change is the way they describe the uh, responsibilities of the rich nations and the poor. And the rich nations really need to take the lead and they need to recognize that reasonable solutions will require them to act more aggressively, more thoroughly, and earlier than developing countries, which will come along as, um, as their development trajectories allow. Uh, but there also is too little focus on international finance. And it's increasingly clear that some of the best investments in climate solutions are going to come from 
financial transfers from rich countries to poor countries, whether they're in the form of, of grants or loans or uh, novel forms of, of international assistance. So we need to make sure that we're supporting climate solutions around the world. There also was too little emphasis on adaptation. You know, we continue to work in a world in which adaptation is viewed as giving up on solving the problem, but adaptation is a key part of the solution. The way to think about adaptation and mitigation as working together is that uh, we need to mitigate to keep things in the space where adaptation is still relevant. Adaptation is increasingly critical because we haven't met the UNFCCC goal of preventing dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. And it's also important as we structure this portfolio of solutions to avoid a one-sided view of environmental justice where we think of enhancing justice purely by um, limiting climate impacts a lot of environmental justice is encouraging the sustained development of economic growth around the world and recognizing that that will require continued utilization of fossil fuels in the world's poor countries. Those are the thoughts I wanted to leave you with. I look forward to your comments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. I'm gonna jump into questions from alumni. Why is population growth generally not addressed? Is it hopeless or taboo? Population growth, super important, and every aspect of the climate challenge would be simpler to tackle if there were fewer people. The, but it's also really, really complicated. It's, it's challenging to figure out what policy levers are most effective for addressing population growth. And it's really complicated in the context of world economies where at this point, uh, decreasing population is becoming a huge problem in many developed countries. So, uh, and then the final thing I'll, I'll say about population growth is that all of the evidence that's available now indicates that the best way to deal with population growth and to lead to decreases is to increase economic opportunities, increase educational opportunities, especially for women. And I think those need to be an important part of the solutions portfolio, those will be addressed uh, almost automatically if we build the kind of portfolio that I've discussed. I don't see a way that addressing population growth in itself can uh, replace this broad portfolio. It needs to be a part, but not the whole. We have another question from Jerry. It seems we have a techno technological know-how to save ourselves, but we are sorely lacking in the leadership and political will to take up the challenge. Our biggest problem seems to be the governance rather than the technology. What do you see on the political front that seems promising? That's a really hard question. And, and that's exactly my point is that we have been way too reluctant to make the kind of commitments that are required. I, I, I think that the answer to that question looks very different in different parts of the world. Uh, the US is probably the country where discussion about climate change and climate change solutions is the most political. And it's an issue that is fundamentally not political at its core, where smart investments pay dividends to everybody and where we're all subject to the impacts of a changing climate. And I'm optimistic that the range of actors who recognize that climate change is a problem that affects us all and where we all can contribute to solutions is moving forward. But the progress has been way too slow and we need uh, creative inputs into figuring out how to accelerate action at the scale of, of, you know, governance at all level, whether it's at the community, the state, the country, or the international community. We have another question from Bill. Michael Mann's 2021 book argues that the fossil fuel companies have changed from denying climate change is occurring to delaying actions by greenwashing. How do we counter this, ta that, this tactic? 
<clears throat> well, yeah, I mean, that, it's true that that there has been a, a pattern of denial. You know, I think you could make the argument that it also is true that the scientific community hasn't been as effective as it should be about highlighting the risks. You know, when I look at the magnitude of the changes we need to make for a just transition, I find it really hard to figure out how that transition could occur uh, without an all hands on deck approach. And that all hands on deck approach is very likely to include the oil and gas companies, which increasingly are making real commitments to developing their capacity to um, deploy renewable energy, to deploy carbon capture and storage. I, I look at the oil and gas companies and at the same time, I see this really uh, you know, frustrating history of denial. I, I also see a huge amount of technology capacity for managing big projects, for drilling precise holes and breaking up rocks underground that, that give us the ability to uh, implement a whole range of solutions that we couldn't implement without their input. And so I would, uh, I would hope that as we, as we look at a future, we recognize that we're going to need to take advantage of the skill sets and the experiences of uh, actors from all kinds of spaces, including actors who have historically been on the wrong side of the issue. A question for, from Linda, what are the most effective and realistic actions that local city governments can take in their climate action adaption plans to help address this important issue? And, and there are a wide range of steps that individuals, communities, countries can take at the, um, at the scale of individual communities, uh, you know, um, commitment to, um, to uh, increasing the fraction of renewable energy and their electricity grid. Uh, in California, a commitment to uh, addressing the risk of wildfire is super important for adaptation. And, um, and you know, creating a culture in which contributions to both emissions reduction and adaptation are really celebrated. It's important. Things like, like even community awards to people who have uh, made the most progress in uh, decarbonizing their, their own households can make a difference. Another question from Garrett. What are, what are alternative prospects and technology to energy storage besides batteries? Yeah, there, there are a wide range of, of options for storing large amounts of energy. Uh, right now, the cheapest way to do energy storage on the grid is called pumped hydro. And the basic idea is to use times when you have excess electricity and pump the water up the hill behind a dam. And then when you need the electricity, let it flow down uh, through the turbines and generate electricity. Uh, ultimately, if we can find a way to convert electricity into chemical bonds, uh, for example, by producing hydrogen when we have excess electricity, storing that hydrogen and then converting it back to electricity then when we need it is, is uh, the, the kind of energy storage that, that's not fundamentally limited the way that batteries are. My guess is that we'll be looking at a, a big portfolio of different technologies that come together to provide this uh, long-term high capacity energy storage, but it's, it's not obvious that any of the individual components until we get to the stage of making electricity from chemicals are, um, are gonna get us there. Another question from Deborah. Can you talk more about the impact of permafrost warming? Sure. Uh, you know, about a quarter of the Northern hemisphere is these permanently frozen soils. And some, especially the soils in Siberia, have large amounts of organic matter frozen in them. As the permafrost thaws, and as you know, the high latitudes have been warming twice as fast as the global average, that organic matter that's frozen into the permafrost 
is subject to decomposition and when it decomposes it releases carbon dioxide and methane to the atmosphere. The big concern about permafrost thaw is that if we warmed enough we could reach a point where the release of greenhouse gases from thawing permafrost sustains warming even if we bring greenhouse gas emissions down to zero. We need to avoid a tipping point where that happens. The evidence is that uh, a tipping point in permafrost thaw is probably higher than three or four C, uh, but we're already seeing evidence of a rapid increase in permafrost thaw, and every increment of increase makes it more and more difficult to solve the climate challenge. We have a question. How are fossil fuel companies influencing Stanford at large and specific departments, institutes, as they provide funding? It's a super hard question. The um, oil and gas companies have historically played a big role in, in funding for some parts of Sanford. My, uh, my personal experience has, has been that, you know, it's, it's very hard to say that that fossil fuel funding has um, had an influence on the orientation of the whole institution but the interests of funders always play a role in um, what research topics are prioritized, um, what kind of faculty are hired. And I do think that one of the things that we need to be aware of, is especially in the context of the launch of the new school focused on climate and sustainability, is that we wanna make sure that, that there's not undue influence of, of any particular perspective, you know, especially influence that prevents us from delivering on the kinds of solutions that I think is our ethical and, and uh, intellectual responsibility. The question from David Klein, there are many reports laying out technology strategies for decarbonization, including many from Stanford. Do you have favorites among them? If, if there's been a single theme in my remarks today, it, it's the importance of thinking about broad portfolios. There are many wonderful technology options, as, as the question states, but there are also limits to almost all of them. And if we deploy a family of technologies that maybe even has more things than seems reasonable, we'll be able to evaluate, refine, improve, build new collections, and really think in terms of, of uh, an energy system that's, that's robust and resilient, as well as able to provide the, the core. So think in terms of broad portfolios. A question at the beginning of your talk, uh, you alluded to the book Unsettled by Stephen Kunin, who questions the fact that climate science is settled. He shares several analyses to make his point. I'm interested in your high level thoughts on this, and would you would like to know if there are detailed responses to his arguments that you can point me to? Sure. Well, um, I'll, I'll go back to my to the third slide I showed, which is that the, the climate models have really uh, precisely projected the future and, and that 30 years ago, they precisely projected where we would be today. It's, it's almost impossible to imagine that happening unless the fundamental physics in those models are right. And, and it, it is true that there are lots of uh, details of, for example, links between climate change and extreme events, lots of details of the way that climate change unfolds into impacts where there's still more to do. But the, but the fundamental science on how greenhouse gases affect the average global temperature really been settled for more than a century. The fundamental issues of uh, whether there are damages associated with warming is really settled from experience. And I think that the, the fact that we're now living in a world that's seeing so many impacts of climate change really removes a lot of the motivation for asking these questions about, um, about fine tuning the responses of the models. If, if, if there's a single thing we've seen in the, in the way that climate change has impacted us, 
it, it's often been that the, uh, the most challenging impacts are, are, are surprises or they're, they come from combinations of factors that weren't necessarily anticipated. So when we think about preparing for a future of climate change and recognize that there are many details that aren't yet known, I, I'd argue that that's a strong incentive to think about uh, comprehensive investments in adaptation, comprehensive investments in taking a precautionary approach to limit the amount of warming that occurs and, and approach all of these things with a humbleness that uh, acknowledges the extent to which we don't know all the pieces. You know, I have a, several questions about nuclear power. Is there a role for nuclear power or even nuclear fusion or are those unrealistic approaches? <clears throat> uh, there is a role for, for nuclear. Uh, I think there's especially a role for keeping existing nuclear going. W one of the big challenges with nuclear is that it hasn't been cost competitive in, in recent years. And many utilities have taken nuclear plants offline as, as renewables have, have gotten to be cheaper. The, <clears throat> uh, I, I think the technology is quite promising for nuclear in the long run and potentially even fusion in the long run. O over the next few decades, when we really need to be building out this transition, it's really hard to see nuclear being cost competitive. My personal feeling is that, that we should be encouraging every technology that has the potential to deliver energy uh, safely and reliably and affordably. And I'm 100% open to giving nuclear a fair shot. I'm skeptical of the extent to which we will see it delivering at scale over the next few decades. There's a question from Dan. In my local climate activism, I'm facing the concern of saving the world for what? A concern about solutions that exasperate wealth and power discrepancies. Any thoughts on readdressing this concern? <clears throat> well, one of the one of the points I emphasized is that uh, environmental justice requires acknowledging the development pathways are important and that in poor parts of the world, we can't expect um, an immediate transition to renewable energy. So, you know, in my in my work with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, there was there was one group of people who said, um, we need to unleash all of the technologies we can to solve this technological challenge of our era. And there were other people who said, well, you can't really imagine a, a fair solution until we get rid of capitalism. And I, I think both groups are right. And somehow we need to operate in a space that, um, that does acknowledge the problems with um, with the way that modern capitalism works, while also acknowledging that modern capitalism is the, the source of almost all the tools we need to address the problem. Uh, can we advance the agenda for environmental justice at the same time as we advance the technologies for tackling climate change? I think the answer is we need to. He employed Stanford to have a more aggressive goal for net zero and be more of a leader. Yes, Stanford should be more of a leader and, and they should commit to 100% decarbonization of the operations and the endowment well before 2050. We have a question from John. Can we get more, get some practical guidance on how to deal constructively with climate change science deniers? <clears throat> You know, in, in my experience, there, there are very few climate uh, change deniers anymore. I, I, I experience this sort of gradual transition from uh, denying that warming's occurring uh, to feeling that, well, uh, it's, it's too expensive to deal with, or the US isn't a big enough emitter globally to make a difference. And um, I, I think that the, the most important response to all the skepticism about delivering solutions is that when we really look at 
solutions that are being considered, they're solutions that make a better world. They're solutions that enable economic development. They're solutions that encourage environmental justice and they're solutions that um, allow us to address uh, other problems that are totally independent of, of climate change problems with air pollution or with uh, clean water and sustainable ecosystems that we, we need to be solving climate change in a spirit and with a dedication to you know building a, a better world and and that's something that is of interest to everyone uh, no matter how they prioritize climate in the spectrum of issues that that need to be dealt with. And we have uh, time for one more question. Can you tell us about Stanford's new school focused on climate sustainability? Absolutely. Uh, incredibly important, exciting development. And I'm really pleased to be able to close with a, a couple thoughts on this. Uh, I highlighted many places where we're running into uh, sticky spots in terms of delivering on solutions. Some of those are in the technology space, energy storage. Some are in the policy space, getting uh, solutions to move. And some are in the communication space. And, and the new school will provide uh, opportunities for progress in all of those. And one of the things that I'm most excited about is that uh, the new school is really focused on, on delivering practical solutions and recognizing that historically, we haven't done a very good job of moving academic research into the real world. And that if we want to be relevant in the 21st century, we need to be much more ambitious about doing that. And I'm, I'm thrilled that it's a real priority in the new school. And I'm proud to be a part of an, of, um, an enterprise that's really focused on delivering real solutions that make a difference for people on the planet.